her and then and then I also hope that there will be a lot of sharing that takes place uh, with what's going on with this being my, uh, Minority Health Month, as well as next week being uh, a Black Maternal Health Week. And I hope that there is a lot of conversation about where we need to go and, and, and what we need to continue to talk about. My name is State Senator uh, Catherine Ingram. I am in the ninth district and I am the co-chair along with Senator Paula Hicks Hudson, uh, uh, who is from Lucas County and uh, as co-chairs of this convening body. And I always wanna make sure that we tell people we are not here trying to figure out how you do your work, nor do we do that work, but we are here making sure that we are trying to get legislation passed that allows you to do the best work for black maternal health and for minority health. And therefore that's why we exist. Uh, and without you, we wouldn't exist, but without you, we'd be pushing you to get this work done still because it's a lot of work that we need to, to do. So anyway, I just wanna mention a couple of things. Uh, the doula bill, there was a uh, press conference this week at the introduction of the doula bill on the Senate side, it is Senate Bill 93. And that is sponsored by uh, State uh, Senator Paula Hicks Hudson and Senator Michelle Reynolds as well as on the House side, I believe it's House Bill 494. Four, there's a companion House bill. bill seven. 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 Okay, fabulous. There is a companion bill in the House, and we want to make sure that these things don't get stopped. We've got a whole GA to get it done, but the sooner the better, because we have people that are working and that need to continue to work. So, uh, I am going to step aside and allow my uh, aide, Deja Kidd, to introduce our guest speaker for this for today. And we're going to try and stay on time, but hopefully we'll have lots of questions. So uh, I'll be back a little later. Deja, take it away. Thank you, Senator. And thank you to everyone for joining us today for our monthly Black Maternal Health Caucus meeting. It's also um, at the start of Minority Health Month, which is April. And today we have Director Angela Dawson of the Ohio Commission on Minority Health to give us an overview of what the commission does, um, ways to get grant funding through the commission and different initiatives that they are working on right now to support um, the improvement of minority health in the state of Ohio. So thank you, Director Dawson, for being here today. Um, we're very excited to hear from you. And you can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. much. Uh, we appreciate it. And thank you so much, Ms. Deja Kidd, for your effort in coordinating uh, this presentation, certainly to uh, the members of the Ohio Black Maternal Health Caucus, our co-chairs, Senator Catherine Ingram and Senator Paula Hudson-Hicks. Uh, we absolutely say thank you for your leadership, for taking this on, and for helping us to pave the way for necessarily policy change as well as legislative change. Those policy changes are critical for us to be able to make lasting change on the systemic issues that are drivers in maternal health mortality. And so definitely I'm so glad to be here and appreciate the opportunity to share. So just wanted to come by and, and briefly talk about eliminating health and healthcare disparities so that we can achieve health equity in maternal health. This, this is a serious issue in our country and it's something that we must address. It's something that affects all of us. So I'm going to advance the slides. I'm gonna, Martin Luther King in 1966 in 1966 said of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is most shocking and inhumane. There is a maternal health crisis in the United States. So I want you to imagine in 1966, Dr. Martin Luther King stood before the second national convention of the Medical Committee for Human Rights and made this statement that unfortunately 
is ever true today. So typically what we have done is we have looked at these significant gaps in infant mortality. And the truth is the persistent gaps in infant mortality have existed for 70 years since the beginning of the documentation of infant mortality. So these racial gaps have really been emphasized over the last decade where Health Policy Institute of Ohio just last week put out this information where infant mortality rate is 164% higher for Black Ohioans than white Ohioans. And so our focus in this state has been infant mortality. And that's why we also commend the originators of the Black uh, Maternal Health Caucus, as well as our current leaders. But we know that there is a crisis in the United States. When last week, the March of Dimes, released the fact that the maternal mortality rate has increased 89% since 2018. So since 2018, maternal mortality as a whole has increased 89%. And that rate was 32.9 per deaths per 100,000 births compared to that rate of 23.8, 89%. And this is a 38% increase, which is more than two times the increase that was observed between 2019 and 2018. And while the rates of maternal mortality have significantly increased for all races and Hispanic groups, we still see these persistent drivers where we see Black and Hispanic women significantly increase. In 2021, Black women were 2.5 times more likely to die than white and Hispanic women. There is a maternal crisis in the United States. The number of pregnant and birthing people dying more than doubled from 1987 to 2018. We are seeing these significant disparities and moreover, the racial disparities are stark because Black and pregnant birthing women are nearly three times more likely. Now, the new evidence that we have is that how COVID-19 exacerbated these outcomes and these inequities that we continue to describe. This is why we have a heightened awareness of why we must address this now. So then the question becomes, how is it that we can work together on policy strategies? How do we inform policy so that we can focus on lowering those rates of maternal mortality and morbidity and eliminating that inequity? How do we begin to highlight the evidence that underpins this, as well as the importance of implementing an equity framework so we can implement these policies. But before we go forward, we have been taught to take a look back. So I wanna make sure we are clear about what we are talking about. There are multiple terms that you will hear in terms of health disparities and health equity. So I wanna make sure we are clear on what we are saying. Health equity is when everybody has the same opportunity for health. Health disparities are those measurable differences in the incidence and prevalence of health conditions and health status and outcomes between groups. For instance, in Ohio, Blacks die at a 77% higher rate than whites from diabetes, a preventable disease. Health inequities are when the measurable differences in those incidents and prevalence and outcomes are the result of underlying social injustice. And when you hear us talk about health care disparities, when we talk about health care disparities, we are really looking at those measurable differences in the provision of health care and health outcomes, even when there's no difference in terms of the health insurance, health status, insurance status, income, or severity of condition. These things are key 
and language is vitally important in policy strategies. So in 1985, the report of the Secretary's Task Force on Black and Minority Health identified these patterns of disparities. So this was the first national attention we had on health disparities as a whole. When we began to see these patterns for African Americans and Native Americans, Latinos, as well as Asian American Pacific Islanders. So in 1999, so 1985 is the disparity. In 1999, Congress requested the Institute of Medicine to assess those racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare and identify the potential sources of those disparities and suggest intervention strategies. And this study was called Unequal Treatment, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare. 1999. And the study committee was struck by what it found because the research was clear. Minorities are less likely than whites to receive needed services, including clinically necessary procedures, even after correcting for access factors such as insurance. In fact, the study committee found that African-American and Hispanics tend to receive a lower quality of care across a range of diseases, whether we look at cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mental health, chronic diseases, or infections. Further, even when the clinical factors such as stage of disease presentation, comorbidities, age and severity of disease were taken into account. Example, we'll, we'll compare a 40 year old white woman with breast cancer, stage one, with a comorbidity of heart disease against a black female, age 40, breast cancer, stage one, with a comorbidity of diabetes. And it did not matter whether these were clinical settings, private or public hospitals, teaching or non-teaching, we die as a result at a higher mortality when these healthcare disparities are present. So the Congress instituted the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Every year for the last 15 years, they produce health disparity reports. When we meet with healthcare systems and hospital systems and our sister state agencies, we need to be examining these type of reports. So it's saying what is no surprise to us who work in the field. So when they looked at data from 2018 to 2021 for quality data, for quality care, you can see that Ohio is in that fourth quartile with the most disparities. We are also one of 10 states with the most racial and ethnic health disparities of all. All the more reason why we have to partner and do the work. So when we look at issues of unequal access, unequal treatment, unequal outcomes, we see these patterns both in Ohio and across the country. Black women are 40% likely to die from breast cancer. We are more likely to be served by poorly and under-resourced health systems. We have a 10 year lower life expectancy for lowest income women. We have lower access to preventative care. We have two to three times higher maternal mortality for not just Black, but also Native American women. And then we have, again, lower rates of that cancer screening. So when we talk about what are the drivers, what are those drivers, and how do we really get at issues to advance health equity? We really must be strategic when we talk about the drivers of health inequity so we can reduce those inequities. And they account for 80% of health outcomes and have a disproportionate impact on communities of color. We know what these are. Stable and affordable housing, healthy foods, reliable income, and interpersonal safety. And we must address the systemic drivers of racism and structural barriers. Our 
focus must be on system change. When we look at the social conditions in which people are born, live, work, play, and pray, these conditions are shaped by political, social, and economic forces. We have to inform policymakers what impacts health. In Ohio, we pour 95% of our healthcare dollar into clinical care, which has a 10% impact on health outcomes. We have to begin to look at the social determinants of health. And those disparities become inequities when they are as a result of unjust distribution of those resources. We know that transportation, food supply, as well as education impact your length and quality of life. We know that those systemic drivers are also existing in all communities. So we know that these issues occur in both communities, whether it's a high opportunity or a low opportunity community, but poorly resourced communities cannot support good health. We know when we talk about economic stability, we mean employment and income. We mean addressing medical bills and having the level of support to manage our debt. When we talk about the neighborhood and physical environment, we mean housing, transportation, and safe places to walk and playgrounds. We know in this day and age, our zip code determines our life expectancy and poorly resourced communities will not be able to support health. When we talk about education, whether it's health literacy or language or vocational training or higher degrees, access to those healthy food options, as well as social support systems and community engagement. When we talk about healthcare systems, we mean healthcare coverage, provider availability, diverse workforce, cultural linguistic competency, as well as the quality of care. Our neighborhoods didn't get this way overnight. And we in this country tend to be ahistoric. We don't want to connect what happened in the past to today. But we know that policies such as zoning and redlining, urban renewal, when highways came through our communities, when we know these things have had significant impact on what is happening today. And so when we look at a red line community, it's simply systematic <laughs> disinvestment. And it's important that we address these issues and reinvest in communities so communities can support health. So redlining was that systematic way of not investing. We know that the quickest way uh, to economic, growing economic wealth is through home ownership. And so when communities are redlined or devalued, that becomes systemic disinvestment. And eventually there will be foreclosures. Eventually there will be an increase in crime and safety issues, as well as health health problems. So when we look at Toledo, um, we look at Toledo and we look at that historic map of redlining. And that redlining map shows what happened as a result of that policy. Senator Ingram, I think you are unmuted. When we also look at it today, and we look at these same hotspot areas with geospatial mapping, and we see the same communities that were redlined are still the same communities that show high rates of not just infant mortality, but cancer, diabetes, maternal mortality, and other disparities. When we look at what we've done to support infant mortality, what I'm saying to this body, to this caucus, we must follow the same path to get the same level of support for maternal mortality. We did statewide tours. We did a five piece legislative package that was introduced by former Senator Charlita Tavares and former Senator Jones. We looked at having a public health crisis, having maternal mortality acknowledged as a public health crisis. Then we seed funded 
the infant mortality hubs in the Commission on Minority Health, then we created the Commission on Infant Mortality and developed a report that eventually became Senate Bill 332. And then funding came again after we lobbied to get funding to scale that model in Ohio. And I'm saying the same type of policy work has to occur to bring to bear the solutions for maternal mortality. So the Commission on Minority Health invested in the infant mortality hub model in the early 90s. Then that model was replicated in Toledo. And then that model began to grow and we were able to double the model. And now we have scaled this model to 12 hubs across the state. The hub model is one way of addressing infant mortality. It is a way to address maternal mortality, but it is still just one way. The commission also funds doula programs. One thing that we know that until Ohio increases its ability to reduce and eliminate these disparities, we must have multiple ways of resolving issues. And we cannot put all the proverbial eggs, if you will, in one basket. So we are proud partners with Birthing Beautiful Communities, just as we are partners with our infant mortality hubs across Ohio. Our current efforts are to expand funding for two additional doula programs in Ohio, and then future efforts how do we bring this model to scale in Ohio? So we, whether we are looking at um, freestanding uh, hospital birthing centers, whether we are looking at group uh, activities, whether we are looking at centering pregnancy, whatever methods we are looking at, as a state, we have to be in the business of putting multiple strategies on the ground. And how do we partner across sister state agencies? How do we insist and ensure there is a seat for community at the table, not after we have developed the strategy, but in the beginning, when we are investigating and trying to develop methods and strategies to resolve this issue. The health value dashboard by the Health Policy Institute of Ohio ranks Ohio 47th in health value, 47. So we are 47 out of 50 states, despite having excellent healthcare systems despite having healthcare systems that people travel from outside of our state to come to. And so what that means is just because we spend money does not mean we will get good outcomes, but we really have to be strategic in how we spend money and making sure we invest in strategies that have a track record for addressing equity and improving birth outcomes. So these inequities cost us. When we look at $32.3 billion, that's what the nine most common maternal morbidity conditions cost us in 2019, $32.3 billion. So we are quick to say, do we have sufficient funds? We may not have sufficient funds, but you're going to pay on one end or the other. And so we are investing in strategies to prevent maternal mortality, prevent infant mortality. And so when we look at the whole issue of maternal mortality, there are multiple opportunities. We looked at increasing coverage. We are a state that increased coverage 12 months postpartum, which is significant. And as time goes on over these five years, because that is in effect for five years, we will definitely see increased access for women to engage as many times as possible with healthcare providers who can identify and spot warning signs for maternal mortality. 
That means we must integrate mental health services and primary care. Anxiety is one and stress are one of the driving factors that we know have an impact. Also, we have to be willing to make investments in community-based models, whether we are talking about doulas and making sure doulas can be a billable service for Medicaid or simply investing more funding in doula programs. We also know that we have a responsibility if we are to achieve equity, to diversify healthcare providers. We continue to get feedback from women who are served in our systems in Ohio, that they really wanna to talk to people who, who look like them and can understand them. So that is a clue for us to work harder on diversifying healthcare providers. When we look at racial equity in maternal healthcare, we have to address issues of unequal treatment. When we look at Black serving hospitals, the hospitals that individuals of color are more likely to go to, they are more likely to perform worse on 12 to 15 delivery indicators and have higher severe more maternal mortality rates than white serving hospitals. These are the things we have to pay attention to on this caucus. We also know that when we look at addressing unequal experience. We know that black birthing people compared to white birthing people are more likely to report being unfairly treated and with disrespect by providers because of their race, not having the decision autonomy during labor and delivery, feeling pressured to have a cesarean. These are the opportunities we have in front of us to hear her and listen. When we talk about addressing unequal outcomes, generally speaking, we think across the board that education is a protective factor. But the truth is that does not hold true for maternal mortality. A Black woman with a college education is at a 60% higher risk for maternal death than a white or Hispanic person with less than a high school education. So even things like education are not protective factors. And even with the same hospital systems, when we look at Black and Latina birthing people, they are more likely to suffer from severe maternal morbidity than white birthing people, regardless of their insurance status. These are opportunities. When we look at health system strategies, all hospitals, regardless of size, should have a planned response to deal with whatever the leading causes of maternal death within 60 minutes. So whether we are talking about hypertension or blood clots or hemorrhaging, every hospital, regardless of size, should have a plan on how to deal with that OB emergency and implement that within 60 minutes. First, hospitals have to implement the recommendations of the Alliance for Innovation and Maternal Health. Ohio became a member of that in 2020. When we look, secondly, all hospitals have to have that multidisciplinary staff meeting. Huddles are what they call them to assess every patient with risk factors. Third, Staff at hospitals should practice drills and simulate these emergencies that can occur in any labor and delivery unit so they are ever ready to respond. And fourth, hospitals should use the maternal health compact. How do we partner to get things done? And then finally, they should ensure that patients have adequate follow-up after discharge. How do we work together with our health systems to say, how can we implement this across the board in Ohio? So no matter where a woman enters into OB care, she is able to get services that are of high quality that are responsive to their needs. These are the opportunities that we have.
But when we look at solutions for how do we reduce inequities, those system issues, we have to address structural racism within systems. We have to address inequitable access to social determinants of health. We have to begin to look at what are these opportunities to improve how we collect data better how do we work with our PAMR, our, our ERASE maternal mortality initiatives that are funded in this state? How do we have them work with us to gather data and create reports annually so we can examine that information and then inform what happens in systems and on the ground? How do we ensure that insurance is something that is available? We know when women are covered, we have better outcomes. And then how do we look at those specific state strategies on how we address disparities within communities at the community level? One of the things we did with the Infant Mortality Hub, Buckeye Health conducted a study that was able to compare women who went through a hub in an area when they made a choice to go to the hub their birth outcomes and cost savings were improved, but there was also a reduction in neonatal ICU and special delivery entry for those infants. We also know that the doulas have an impact on lower cesarean rates, higher satisfaction. We know the evidence is clear. So how do we go about implementing and offering these services especially when the listening sessions for Medicaid indicate in Ohio, this is what the people are asking for. And how do we work with our sister state agencies to come together to get this achieved? It can be done. When we look at those state policies to improve maternal and health outcomes, we know that in Ohio and generally across the country, Medicaid is sharing a burden of producing and being responsible for birth outcomes. In Ohio, it's over 50%. Across the country, it's at least 45%. So that means we have a partner who is able, willing, and ready to come to the table to look at what can we do for policy, for coverage and benefits, how do we add doula so that it is a covered benefit? How do we look at uh, expanding freestanding birth centers? We know that is covered. How do we look at care delivery transformation? We know that we have to be able to have access to treatment and support services for high-risk women, with, especially with coexisting health conditions. How do we go about addressing provider bias? What are the opportunities for that? And then looking at data and oversight, how do we look at collecting that maternal health data, letting that maternal health data inform us, and then informing the public so we can make those differences? When we look at the issue of disparities and what happened during COVID, we know that COVID simply pulled back the curtains on what was already occurring. COVID-19 did not create systemic drivers in disparities. It simply exacerbated it. It pulled back the curtains. But this, this slide from Health Policy Institute of Ohio really talks about how we have to address the structural drivers and how from a policy and system perspective, we really have to take a look at healthcare quality and access, the social and economic environment, as well as the physical environment, because we know that those co-disparities, those comorbidities are really what were the drivers in excess deaths in COVID-19. What are our opportunities to learn from COVID? What did we do during COVID? We came together, broke down silos and ways in this state 
we had never done before historically. And so now we have these opportunities to continue to build on these relationships. We know that this was done during COVID, but we can maintain that communication, breaking down those silos to make sure as state agencies, we work together with our local partners and our programs on the ground to continue to ensure access. Here's what we know. We were able with the COVID-19 strike force to acknowledge that racism was a public health crisis and we commit to swift action to address and dismantle racism, which is a driving force. We know that the governor came back with a plan to advance health equity, acknowledging that racism was a public health crisis. How do we take this equity plan? How do we use this plan and the actions in it to advance what the Black Maternal Health Caucus is doing? How do we work across those systems? Progress should be reform-driven. Reforms should be policy-driven and policy should be data-driven to benefit the people most impacted. We have to use data-driven strategies to implement policy change. But achieving equity means that we value all individuals equally. Who's at the table and who's not? What's on the agenda and what's not? And we cannot be intolerant of inaction in the face of need. We must continue to address this issue. We have to recognize and rectify historical injustices and provide resources over a protracted period of time. We have done something in Ohio. We have come to a near goal for white infant mortality. We are at 5.4. The goal is 5.0 for 2030. This is a time that we can reinvest in other strategies to address not just infant mortality, but maternal mortality. But we have to be willing to do this over a protracted period of time. This recent improvements in white infant mortality and the small improvement we saw in black infant mortality were because we have been investing over the last 10 to 12 years for strategic intentional outcomes. And we cannot stop when we do not see the needle move quickly. We know the term a rising tide lifts all boats. And so we think because we made this investment, all boats will rise equally and such is not the case. We know that our women that we serve, Black women in Ohio who are birthing women have boats with holes in them because of social determinants of health. They have boats because of lack of housing, lack of access, lack of quality care. And so when the tide rises for them, they are bailing water, simply trying to stay afloat. And so our job is to get a new boat so that they can have the benefits of system investment. When we talk about health equity, that's when everybody has the potential to achieve. But we really have to be able to look at what is important, assess those needs, implement programs that have been proven to work, do it over a protracted period of time, and allow the individuals in the programs to tell you if the program is effective and be willing to listen. Our continued efforts can be in utilizing PAMAR and Erase Maternal Mortality Surveillance Systems for annual reporting, to modernize our racial and data, ethnic data systems, to expand opportunities for community level policy participation to strengthen primary care and improve delivery of services, to invest in social services that eliminate social determinative health barriers, 
to expand funding for doula programs and ensure Medicaid reimbursement for these services. We can look at workforce development and workforce diversity and trainings to address cultural competency and implicit bias training. How do we expand efforts for that CDC model, that listening model that's called Hear Her, where we intentionally listen to what our women are saying when they experience our services and our systems of care? How do we increase our AIM activities and provide regular reporting to the public? How do we work across state systems? How do we work together? We've been at the table and we will stay at the table, but we may want to make sure that the community's voice is at the table as well. I would be remiss if I didn't share that we have funding opportunities at the commission. Uh, we are funding doula programs, so I do encourage uh, individuals who are on this call to pursue this funding announcement. Uh, this is our biennial grant award. And then we also have uh, lupus funding as well as opiate funding as well. April is Minority Health Month. Uh, many people do not realize that Minority Health Month was created in the state of Ohio in 1989. And it continues uh, to be a celebration. And in the year 2000, it became a national celebration. And so this is not just Minority Health Month in Ohio, but it's Minority Health Month across the country. Uh, the Commission on Minority Health funds many grants for Minority Health Month. And so our calendar of event is on our website. So we encourage you to visit an event near you, but we also share this month with our Black Maternal Health Week, uh, which is celebrated every year, April 11th through the 17th. And so we are excited about Black Maternal Health Week and we are excited about M Minority Health Month. So happy Minority Health Month, happy Black Maternal Health Week. Celebrate in ways that allows your voice to be heard so that we can empower others and ourselves to do the work to eliminate disparities. Senator Ingram, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Senator, do you want me to go ahead and say a few things? I think you're muted. <laughs> All right, so I'll go ahead and just say, first off, thank you so much, Director Dawson, again, for your wonderful presentation today. It was so informative. You're so great at being able to articulate these things um, and helping others understand. And I know sometimes different terms and things like that are hard because not everyone has access to understanding certain language and things like that. So I really do appreciate you like breaking a lot of it down for everyone today so that other folks are able to, you know, just be a part of this conversation and feel like they have that autonomy and that knowledge to be able to advocate for themselves and, you know, speak on this topic and how it impacts their community. So Again, just you're just wonderful. Thank you so much. And I also just want to make a note to everyone that is in attendance today that there is an opportunity to have questions if you have them. Um, there is a Q&A function um, with this kind of Zoom style we're doing as a webinar. Um, so feel free to put your questions if you have them up at the, um, should be at the top of your window. It says Q&A. You can go ahead and type a question there if you have one. Um, so I'll let some folks, if you need to, maybe give them a minute to do that. Um, we did have two questions in there, but before I get to that, Senator Ingram, if you have anything that you would like to say. I uh, unmuted. I think somebody may have unmuted me. Yeah, you're good to go. We can hear you. So you can okay, go ahead. Fine. Well, first of all, thank you, Director Dawson, for that. And of course, as, as uh, Deja has indicated, that you did a great job. I see a lot of work that we need to do. Uh, and of course, to, to make sure that one of the things you did talk about was making sure we're working with our partners across the across the board because the social determinants of health 
uh, are ones that add into all of this and we can't do it separately. And when we start talking about, well, we gave the minority health people some money, they should go do that. No, I need JFS. I need the Department of Health. I need uh, transportation. I need economic development. We start talking about if I've got more people who are capable of working and living in those areas, and that makes a, a difference for, for all of us. And that's my spiral story. I also want to mention that the Ohio Children's Caucus met, uh, I believe it was on Monday, and some of the information that they gave was very good, also ties right into what we're talking about as far as, as housing and all of those other needs that go together. The, the problem I have is that eventually we're going to have to make sure that some of what we talk about becomes bills again. We need to make sure that we don't want to legislate everything, everybody's actions. But if I need to say to the health department, why aren't we getting these reports? And uh, do these reports make a difference? And because the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And I say that all the time. And if you consider that poor and minority folks uh, are a weak link when it comes to health and uh, economic development and things of that nature, then you need to put your money where your mouth is and your actions where your mouth is. But uh, I heard a couple of things. And uh, here again, the most important is that we're not gonna go away. I do believe that Director Dawson says is that we, we won't give up and that's what we have to be about all of this. Um, we've got to do policy that's reform. We have to, uh, as a first vice president of the Black Caucus, I believe that part of our, the legislative Black Caucus is part of our work is to, to look at all of the bills that are coming across and saying, how are they impacting uh, minorities in our community period? And if the, the rising, I'm, I love the story about the uh, rising tide floats all boats, because as you say, uh, some of us need new boats and that uh, boat with the hole in it ain't going to get it. There's only so much uh, bailing out you can do. So if there's any questions and uh, um, Deja, Absolutely. you go there, there are questions and certainly to Mr. Uh, Dorian Lingard, um, thank you for your question and your comment. Um, his question uh, is really talking about the uh, excellent work that Root has done since 2017. Um, this is a uh, doula program that has never lost uh, a child. And when we talk about doula programs, we are seeing uh, these types of results. We see this across the country. And the preterm birth rates, as well as the low birth weight rates, are significant. His question is, um, why is the state not heavily invested in our data-driven strategy solution that has solved Black infant and maternal mortality? Well, as let me speak as this state agency, Mr. Wingard, you know there is not a time that we put out funding that I don't personally inform you of those uh, opportunities. And so we certainly absolutely uh, want to invite you to apply for funding. But I think your broader question is really about how we get the state to heavily invest in these strategies that we know are data-driven and improving to drive down strategies. That is exactly why uh, we've introduced the doula legislation. Uh, this is exactly why uh, when we looked at the co-sponsorship uh, with Senator Paula Hudson Hicks, Senator uh, Reynolds, as well as Senator, uh, Representative White and Representative Humphrey, who will involve uh, that language in House Bill 7 on their side. Uh, this is why we are pushing that uh, at piece of legislation, because again, this will introduce uh, the ability for doulas to be reimbursed by Medicaid, which will then expand uh, their uh, book of business and expand their capacity to serve uh, other individuals and have a broader serving base. But I think that we continue uh, to provide the data-driven strategies, not just uh, within our caucus uh, for Black and maternal health, but by engaging with legislators so that they are aware that the data is evident. Uh, when we said, when I said before, we can't have one solution 
when we have the type of outcomes that we do. We need to have multiple strategies on the ground to address this issue. So thank you again uh, for being uh, on the call today, Mr. Uh, Wingard. Well, and you know, let me say this. I, yes. I, can't see, I can't see his questions because I, I'm on my phone and my kids keep telling me I need to upgrade. But uh, part of what needs to happen is that when we do have the money, and not just monies that are being uh, given to the Black, uh, to the Minority Health Caucus, to you, to the director, to you, it's the, what's going into mental health, it, it, the health department, it's what's going into JFS, how too are they making sure that those dollars that they are expending are coming back to where they need to be. The part of the problem is, is when we started talking a, a while ago in, 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 um, in General Assembly about uh, Black maternal health or about uh, health deficiencies or disparities, period, we give money, or when we were talking foster care, we give money to certain agencies and then they just it's up to them to distribute it from the state level. My concern is, is that are we sure that the state is doing that in a way that gets to where it needs to be, which is down to the local level. So we don't wanna to have to pass legislation for everything, but that's what we need from you folks. Uh, as legislators, we need to hear that, well, we're not getting that money. And, and therefore those disparities that have been there, that's why it takes 10 or 12 years to get anything done. And that's, that's not what we need to do. We need to make sure that that's what's happening. So I'm not gonna codify any individual program or whatever in legislation, but I will make sure that we fight back to those dollars who are funded through the general revenue fund and who get federal dollars down as pass-throughs through them are making sure it gets to the local level and therein lies part of the issue. They get to do the choosing and how they do it, I don't know. So you guys have to help us with that. Uh, I, uh, I wanna say this too while I'm here, uh, is that the, your slide presentation, if you can send that to whomever wants it. I don't know if, if, if we got emails for everybody, but if anybody wants that, then they of course can always get it. I, I think that that would be appropriate too, because I definitely wanna see some things that were targeted at policy. Certainly, uh, and uh, I have already uh, sent, and I will send a version of this uh, presentation so that it has, uh, people can access that. Also, um, when we talk about the issue of infant mortality, infant mortality, we are talking about the definition of uh, when a baby dies um, within one year of their birth. And so when we talk about, when we talk about the issue of infant mortality, that is what we mean by uh, infant mortality. So thank you for that uh, question. Also, thank you to uh, Senator Herschel uh, Craig. Uh, we appreciate your comments uh, to our um, co-chairs of the maternal mortality uh, caucus as well for your comments on dedication and leadership. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have a question on stillbirths. Stillbirths is, uh, again, this is becomes an issue of data. Uh, data is important as coming from Mr. Uh, Adam Holmes. Uh, all data is important. Our collection of data by race and ethnicity to the lowest geographic level is important. Going back to Senator Ingram's point of making sure they're data-driven strategies. This is why geospatial mapping and heat maps are important because where we put services should be where the need is. And so the commission has placed hubs in areas of the state that have the highest preterm birth rates. And those are the areas that are prioritized. Uh, but you are correct, sir, it, there is disparities in, in stillbirths and we need to have the collection of that data and the availability of data to the public so it's readily uh, available. That is, that is absolutely uh, important. And then I believe, um, yes, 
and we are having requests more for the slides and we will make sure uh, that those are available. I encourage people um, to recognize the, the impact that you have. You can impact 10 to 20 people in your immediate circle to put the pressure to bear at city council, at county commissioners, at the state level. I encourage people to come and testify. You have five minutes to testify, but I encourage you because your voice is essential and your voice needs to be heard. As a state director, I absolutely want you to hold me accountable to what I am supposed to do. The commission has a budget that is just under $6 million. And so again, uh, we can do the work that we have historically done, but the impact within larger budgets, our ability to move that needle is going to be reduced based on our size. And again, uh, we are responsible. And so we are investing in programs that demonstrate a return on investment. We also invest in programs and in community-based agencies so we can build their capacity to demonstrate a return on investment and demonstrate their, increase their capacity to expand and diversify their funding sources. So we do that through capacity building programs. It is the final minute of the hour. I want to turn that back to Senator Ingram to thank her for the opportunity to share. Uh, I am ever a servant of the people. I say that sincerely and want you all to know that the commission avails itself uh, to you. And we want to continue to work with our partners in state agencies and local agencies uh, to show that we can address these social determinants of health. I encourage people to look at the panel discussion from the Commission on Minority Health kickoff that focused on resources at the state for social determinants of health. Senator Ingram. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we're gonna be respectful of your time, but I do wanna make sure everybody uh, next week is uh, Black Maternal Health Week. There are a lot, I know of Cradle Cincinnati and the Queens Village have a whole week of events and, and uh, 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 talks and webinars that they'll be giving. I also know and would like for you to share with us any events that you are having as a separate organizations that we can um, at least uh, acknowledge and maybe spread the word from our office. I'll have my aide put that out for you to all of our, our, our districts so that to my constituents and they go to uh, quite a lot of people so we can get that information out for you. I think that the, the, the thing is that we've said this and when you mentioned Senator Tavares, the thing is, is that we've been doing this a long time. She started doing that a long time ago before her. If it hadn't been for Helen Rankin back in the 90s, we wouldn't have mammograms right now. So every person, black and white female can thank the, thank that she got that covered by insurance. So these are things that we can do and we need to continue to do. And remember that we are in this game together. That it's not about uh, who gets what and you got more than me and any of that. It's about how do we get it done? And, and I want you to help me do that because I know there are some very smart people on the line. I haven't looked at the list, but I, I, I know that you're there for a reason. So share with us where we need to go and what the legislation needs to be, how we need to create new policy. Uh, the whole housing issue is 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 very different, but I, I, I'm telling you that in the environment that we are working in right now, where Senate Bill 83 says that institutions of higher education in Ohio cannot include, D, they need to eliminate uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion divisions in their institutions, as well as eliminate that language in their uh, missions and policies and threatened um, private institutions that if they don't come up with policies that exclude helping separate groups, that they too will not be able to, to get capital money. 
My fear is, is that though we are talking about black maternal health and minority health and all these things that we know are good because here again, they improve all of us. That the language is such that they're trying their best to not have that conversation about the disparities that they know exist. They want you to take your little bit of money and go to the corner. And we refuse to do that. So you've got to help us do that. So any last words, Director Dawson? Um, what I'm going to say is that um, the challenges that we face today are real. I'm going to remind you that the challenges my grandmother faced in 1900 were very, very real. Mm -hmm. And she did what she needed to do in her season of opportunity so that I could do what I need to do in my season of opportunity. So I'm going to say I am unabashed, I'm unashamed, I am here. And I don't feel no ways tired. We have to do this. We don't have the option but to do what we are supposed to do. And so as uh, our late Congressman said, we're gonna keep getting in good trouble because we have a good work ahead. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And if Hicks, uh, uh, Senator Hicks Hudson was here, she'd say thank you too. I will be in touch folks. So enjoy the rest of the day. I'm going to the baseball game. Thank uh, you. Uh, <laughs> bye. I can't even leave. Thank you again. Cut me 